I'm calling okay, for everybody. Charlotte McLean to please come up onto stage. Charlotte McLean to stage, thank you. Samita, are we good? Charlotte McLean? The Lady Charlotte McLean? Oh, I can hear you. Where are you? Are you causing trouble down the back there? Of course you are, Charlotte. Come on. There you are. Oh, and you're wearing green. Hi, Gordon. How are you? Oh, it's great to see you. Wonderful. Sorry, I just couldn't Don't worry. Okay, is everybody here? So is the person who came last. <laughs> Can we get started? Yeah. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, sorry to start a bit late, my apologies. My name is Charlotte McLean and Clapo. I'm the Global Disability Advisor at the World Bank Group. And today I'm wearing a green jacket and a colorful shirt. Um, I'm a brown woman, I've got long brown hair, and I'm really thrilled to be at, at zero. So very excited to, to have been asked to moderate this session. So this session is a very important session. It's a session that talks about, will talk about the importance of funding and donor agencies' work in relation to supporting disability inclusion. And so we have an excellent panel, albeit a rather large panel. And so I will ask colleagues to please stick to the five minutes that they've been allocated um, per presentation. What we would like to do is have the presentations and then open the floor for questions and answers and comments and make this as interactive as possible. I have asked each one of the panelists beforehand on a, on a prep call to introduce themselves and their organizations when they take the floor. And with, without further ado, I think we should get started. So again, please listen attentive, attentively. We will have a, quest, a, a section for, for Q&A. So I'd like to start off um, with a presentation and hand over the floor to the Ford Foundation to Catherine Townsend. Thank you so much, Charlotte. My name is Catherine Hyde Townsend. I serve as a senior advisor for disability inclusion at the Ford Foundation. 
I'm a middle-aged white woman with long brown hair wearing tortoiseshell glasses. My pronouns are she and her. It's a pleasure to be here today and share with you how the Ford Foundation is approaching disability grant making. Grounded in Ford's global vision for social justice, our disability grant making is responsive to national and local contexts. Ford's vision is a world in which all individuals and communities can enjoy their human rights and actively participate in civic space, a topic of this year's Zero Conference. Ford weaves disability into its grant making. So you see here on a slide a blue shaded oval, and our offices are listed, and they include the Andean region, Brazil, Mexico and Central America, China, Indonesia, India, Nepal and Sri Lanka, the Middle East and North Africa, West Africa, Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, and the United States. Our offices align their disability grant making with global strategies that are most relevant to the pressing political contexts. The global programs include, and there is a green circle that reads global programs, civic space, digital rights, the future of work, and gender-based violence. At Ford, disability is not a standalone strategy, but rather it's reflected in our diverse funding themes and in every regional office in which we work. In 2022, we made around 100 disability-specific grants, totaling about $22 million. We also made grants that are disability inclusive with a specific intent to include people with disabilities in a broad array of activities. For example, in our technology and society program, the team invests in internet policies and standards for the public interest. The way that we address disability within that strategy is to ensure that people with disabilities are part of the public. And this means looking at things like ableism in artificial intelligence, or accessibility standards in public policy. To advance inclusion in all of our grant making strategies and practices, we have practical guidance which catalyzes grant making. Strategies include people with disabilities based on political and cultural contexts grounded in human rights. Our leadership sets targets and regularly reviews disability grant making. This means that teams are held accountable for disability inclusive grant making, just as they are other benchmarks. In addition, we're increasingly connecting our disability commitments with commitments around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Lastly on this slide reads, the advisor, that would be me, provides technical support, learning, and networking throughout the Ford offices. I'd like to note one clear challenge about Ford's approach. Because we're aligning our disability grant making with our strategies, it means that we are not starting from the priorities of the disability community. That means that we try as much as possible to do outreach as we're developing those strategies, refreshing those strategies, and creating thought partnership with the communities that we work with. I'd like to just take a quick moment to talk about the criteria that we use to assess disability inclusion. Like any due diligence, not every project will do all of these things well. We look at five elements. First, and perhaps most critical, is that the organization uses a social justice and human rights approach. That it centers people with disabilities and addresses structural discrimination. So at the Ford Foundation, we focus on advocacy and policy change and do not provide funding for services. Second, we look at organizational commitment. Ideally, we all know that this starts with a leader or a champion within the organization. And the more support that that champion has from senior leadership or their peers, the better. 
Historically, some organizations have experienced lack of donor interest in their work in disability, or even resistance, quite frankly. Donors are in a position to empower champions, strengthen their internal influence, and in turn, deepen the organization's commitment to disability rights. Second, we look at program inclusion. The strongest projects and organizations involve people with disabilities at the highest levels, not simply as constituencies to be targeted. I often advise the teams at Ford that vague ideas of consultation or inclusion of marginalized communities is unlikely to work. So we use three questions when we look at program inclusion. When, who, and how. Third, we look at budgets. Are disability activities or accommodations supported by the budget? It's really important for our staff to understand that, and for our grantees, that accommodations do not take money away from the work, they are the work. And then lastly, we look at research and data. Data and research helps address what we often see as the invisibility of people with disabilities. And as the saying goes, what counts what gets counted, excuse me, counts. Data disaggregation also supports advocacy, whether that be internal or external. And then lastly, when grantees are using participatory research that includes people with disabilities, we walk the talk of inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for an excellent um, presentation, sharing with us Ford's um, approach. I think, you know, just to highlight the importance of holding teams accountable, connecting disability inclusion to the wider DNI agenda is really important. I think the premise that you depart from around social justice and the human rights approach really sits well in terms of your grant making and is completely linked to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, I like the fact that your grant making is centered around disability. And I think the three questions that you asked, the when, who, and how, are really important. And because this discussion is on new strategies of development funding, the budget question is also really important. So the kind of follow the money is, is really an important piece to think about when we think about disability inclusion and funding agencies. So thank you very much, Catherine. So we'll move along. And um, now we move to our guest from the Sabanchi Foundation. And we will ask Nevko to take the floor. Over to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, welcome all. I'm very happy to be together with you today. My name is Nevgül. I'm the general manager of Sabanchi Foundation from Turkey. For those who cannot see me, I'm a white woman with brown hair and green eyes. Today I'm wearing a green jacket with a red blouse. Uh, before I start my, my turn, I would like to say a few words about the earthquake in Turkey and Syria that has happened very recently. On the 6th of February, very early morning, 4 a.m., we were hit in the southeastern part of Turkey with an earthqu earthquake with a magnitude 7.7. .7. Same day, there was a second one, uh, very, very high magnitude, 7.6, and it was 11 cities in total affected which means uh, lots of people, about 14 million people were the population. Many people lost their lives. The last figure was more than 41,000 people lost their lives. Uh, many houses, many houses, it's expected to be more than 500,000 houses to be uh, collapsed or to be collapsed because they are heavily affected. So we are facing a very difficult time in the region. Uh, of course, I would like to thank to those organizations who have immediately supported us, 
but I would like to say that the support is welcomed. We will need more. The healing will take long. Still, we are in the stage uh, of the very early, early days, let's say, uh, where we have the humanitarian support as a priority, but it will follow, of course, with other types. So we are all very sorry as a foundation since the very first day, we have started uh, to work closely with our stakeholders, with everybody we can reach, to be honest, to give the support, to give our help. And still we continue with the team to do our best. Uh, today and tomorrow, we will meet our colleagues to learn more about their experience, to share the experience and we will feel uh, more confident with, our, with, our, with the support that we will have from you. So now let me continue with what is uh, part of this panel, uh, grant making our strategy as Sabanju Foundation. I would like to talk a little uh, more about it. Our foundation in Turkey is the biggest family foundation. We are almost 50 years old now very similar to Ford Foundation, our vision is having a society in Turkey where all individuals enjoy their rights equally. Our foundation has uh, three areas of focus, education, arts and culture, and social change. In all the activities and programs and projects, our target groups are women, people with disabilities, and the youth. Yes. Now, more specifically about the grant program. Our grant program is a national one. Since 2007, we continue with the grant program without any break. As you will remember, we had hard times, the COVID time, the pandemic time. We never stopped our grant program. Our grant program is there since 16 years with many projects so far supported by us under the program. It has been 218 projects out of which 50 projects, about one quarter, is about projects on disability side. We have reached with all the projects more than 300,000 people so far, and it covered 81 cities of Turkey. We are the only one in Turkey with such a size of a program, grant program, grant making program, and with this number of years being active uh, as uh, providing the support to NGOs. The program has two main uh, bodies. One is called Open Call Grant Program. The other part is called Invited Grant Program. So as you can imagine, Open Call Grant Program is an open call. Every year, beginning of January, we make a call to NGOs, inviting them uh, to apply with their projects. The, the application period is one month, and projects with the team education being applied by the NGOs. The education has two sub-themes. They can apply either with projects supporting the quality education, or with projects supporting rights-based non-formal education. After the application, on average, 300 projects are uh, applied almost every year. We have an evaluation committee included with activists, with civil society professionals from, from, the, from the sector to do the evaluation. We don't do the evaluation ourselves only. We are a committee together. I think this way our program becomes very participatory. 
that what we put a lot of value on. Uh, this program is supporting projects with one year duration. After, after one year, of course, we evaluate the project. If it is needed another year to finalize properly, to progress, uh, if the need is there, we give our support for another year. But in principle, it's a one-year program. The other one is called Invited Grant Program. The invi Invited Grant Program has uh, three focus. It's either disability rights or gender equality or quality education. With this program, actually, we are supporting longer term projects. On average, three years is the duration. And we invite the NGOs to bring us the project on the, on the needed field. And it is then uh, discussed and uh, evaluated and the grant is given accordingly. So in both of these programs, capacity building of the grantees is quite important. Accessibility and inclusion are the keywords. When we have the grantees, one of the very first trainings we give them is accessibility training. Before the project starts, they receive an accessibility training with us and we put them in contact with our accessibility solution partners. And to, facil to facilitate the accessibility journey, we also share two resources with the grantees. One of them is the social media accessibility guide, and the other one is called best practices having accessible events. In our approach, we would like to, uh, we like to promote the intersectional approach. We always encourage the grantees to include persons with disabilities in their activities, regardless their main target group. Participation of people with disabilities and their representation in the organization is critical for us. We evaluate the projects based on the, of course, participation and the representation. To give you an example, if an organization has a project for people with disabilities, but the target group is not represented in the organization or in the partner organization, this project has a very little chance that, will, that we will uh, approve the project for grant, grant receiving. In parallel with nothing about us without us motto, we know that persons with disabilities themselves know the best for them. Right. To give some numbers, okay, in the last five years, out of the 12 organizations we supported, Six of them were established and coordinated mainly by people with disabilities. Four of them were partnered with disability organizations and the two projects were conducted by academic staff and they coordinated the materials with the Ministry of Education. So the last slide, I wanna pass to the last one. This is about a project which has received our grant in the program. The project was implemented last year very recently. It was an online platform for women with hearing disabilities. The organization has been working with deaf people for so many years and there are so many deaf people in the organization. They realized that in Turkey many existing platforms uh, did not have the proper uh, setup, the proper information about rights for women with hearing disabilities. So in order to support this, uh, this uh, field, many videos, about 50 videos were taken. 
and women, they learned about their rights, <coughs> sexual rights, e equality rights, economic rights, and many, uh, many related ones were on the videos. Uh, workshops were organized and their feedback was very valuable. The website is still open, it continues, and it has been designed in the intersectionality with the gender equality and disability. Thank, thank you, I'm thank going you. to ask you to stop thank there. Uh, please give her a round of applause. <laughs> and, and just to say at the end, we're going to collect all of the presentations from the panelists so people can go back and look into the details because obviously there's a lot more than just the five minutes that everybody has. I just wanted to say that we'd like to send our thoughts to the people of Turkey after the, the aftermath of the earthquake. And, and thank you very much for elucidating some of Sabanchi's work. Um, I think the education, arts and culture, and social change is kind of your pillars, which is really interesting. And in some ways, it's different from Ford in that your focus is mainly on a na you're a national grant-making agency as opposed to Ford being an international grant-making make agency. I think the issue of intersectionality is one that's already permeating from already the, the two presentations that we've had. So I'd like to move on quickly to the Kessler Foundation and invite Elaine to speak. And I'm pleased I'm going to ask you to speak for five minutes because we do have other colleagues um, that are waiting. Over to you, Elaine. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm an older white woman with short brown hair, brown glasses, and wearing a gray-green sweater and a black blouse and a big silver necklace. I wanted to start by sharing some information about Kessler Foundation for those of you who may not be familiar with our work. Uh, Kessler is located in East Hanover, New Jersey in the USA, and we're an NGO, a public charity. Our mission is to change the lives of people with disabilities through rehabilitation research, improving cognition and mobility for individuals with various disabilities. Our grant-making focus is entirely focused on increasing competitive employment for people with disabilities and the belief that employment is fundamental for achieving independence and economic security as well as personal fulfillment. We are known as the leading funder of innovative employment hiring initiatives in the U.S. through our Center for Grant Making, which has invested more than $50 million over the past 14 years in New Jersey and nationally to create genuine economic opportunities for people with disabilities. Through these projects, we hope to create changes in culture and workplace attitudes to increase employment. You can visit our Center um, for Grant Making online to see our, all of our grant programs and their focus. However, we're so time limited to th this morning, I'm going to discuss our signature grant program, an initiative that we plan to pursue in 2013. Our signature grant programs have are two years, oh, and we give away over a half a million dollars over that time for projects in the U.S that have bold, innovative strategies that can affect systematic change to organizations to transform the concept into action. These projects are typically pilots and new models that have the potential for adaptation by public and private institutions. And we hope that they'll change today's marketplace when thinking about employment. Usually these projects are new ideas. So just to give you an example of three projects, our signature grant programs are evidence-based projects externally evaluated by a third party, and they require disability organizations working in employment to forge new collaborations within their communities and working within, work within economic development, corporate and private groups, working to build those inclusive, sustainable, and visible communities. Some examples of our projects in 2022, um, we funded and our, um, their logos are on the screen. The first one is ES Coach, um, and that's a project of the University of Massachusetts Institute for Community Inclusion. It's a smartphone-based app, so the software has already been created. 
um, and it's designed to help teams of employment consultants and their managers manage their employment supports, reflect on what they're doing, set some goals, and to take action to improve their practice. The project will study how the ES, ES coach works with the professionals. The program includes three major components, assessment of time, micro-learning, and collecting real-time data and also coaching. The program will be used with 48 employment programs in the U.S. Next, we have a uh, logo of an apple with NYC at work inside. We're one of the first funders of NYC at work along with the Poses Family Foundation. That program was recognized a couple of years ago actually by the Zero Project. Um, it's an employment program that recruits, pre-screens, and connects New Yorkers with disabilities to jobs and internships within established businesses both within the private and public sector. Lastly, we have the logo of the Society for Human Resource Managers uh, with the title of their program called Employing Abilities at Work. This is a certification program that was started in 2022. It's a free course and covers the basics on onboarding, hiring, retaining people with disabilities. It also talks about the Americans uh, with Disabilities Act, which is a US law that companies uh, have to be aware of. And also what it is really a good tool for anybody who works in the employment field, those who place people, those who work at NGOs, and since it's free, um, please visit the website and enroll in the course. Lastly, uh, for 2023, we are creating a skill-based grants program, and this is really a pro bono donation of time to an organization rather than a cash grant. The professional expertise and time of a Kessler staff member is donated to help a nonprofit organization strengthen their infrastructure for successful employment programs through capacity building and communities of practice. I think some of the takeaways that I'd like you to have from this presentation is that we're always open to conversations on collaborations. We see innovation as a key to our larger signature grants, and we're really looking to assist a disability-focused NGOs through skill-based strategic collaborations. Back to you, Charlotte. Excellent, Elaine, thank you so much. A round of applause for Elaine. And it's really great to have a Zero Alumni awardee on the stage sharing the example um, with many of the, the new awardees, so that's great. I think it was really interesting to, to hear the Kessler pres presentation because your focus is very specific, right? Your focus is very much on competitive, integrated employment, and, and clearly you focus on issues around evidence-based information to ensure that your, your projects are, are scalable, and I think you've been able to demonstrate that. Um, and I, I, I like the fact that it's linked to um, changing today's marketplace, so, so you have an end goal in terms of your grant making, so that's really exciting to hear. So we'll move along to the Nippon Foundation, and um, from the Nippon Foundation, we will hear from Ichiro Kabawasa, uh, who's the executive director there. So over to you. Kabasawa, apologies. Hi. Um, today, it's going to be Yosuke speaking. Um, I am a program director for the International Disability Inclusion Program of the Nippon Foundation. Um, I'm an Asian man with black hair, wearing glasses. I am uh, wearing dark blue jacket, light blue shirt with a dark blue tie. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for um, taking part in this session uh, for those of you online and on site. Um, today, how do I? Oops. How do I? Oh, this one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Today, I um, I let me give you an overview of our international disability inclusion program, and plus some um, introducing some um, <coughs> new initiatives as well. So basically, we focus on deaf, blind, and physical disability and we act, uh, we fund projects mainly in Asia with few um, exceptions, exceptions which are global initiatives. Uh, we basically aim to build a disability inclusive society by supporting initiatives that has a potential to be leveraged or sustained or even change the system itself. 
So we do have a domestic disability inclusion program, but today I'm focusing on the international programs only. Uh, we have four programs, and let me explain briefly one by one. The first one is the prosthetics and orthotics program, which we call it the PO program. We have established PO schools starting in Cambodia, and then we have expanded to Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand. And we are working on Myanmar from 2012. We usually um, try to integrate PO system to national health systems, which is critical for a sustainable systematic change, which is the important criteria of our grant making. So our uh, 576 grantees ser has served uh, more than 500,000 patients by 2027, 2017, sorry, the figures are a bit old, but the number is uh, um, actually accelerating. And you can read this report, uh, impact report on our program on ISPO's webpage if you are very interested. The second one is the education programs. We, for example, we execute bilingual deaf education in Asia as well as advocacy and academic work like sign linguistics and legal recognition of sign languages. We also build capacity of universities to be able to accept students with visual disability and make sure they receive the same quality of education as others. We also have some scholarship programs for disability community to study in universities in their home countries or in abroad. The third one is disability inclusion in business. Although we have been investing heavily in education for the past few decades, mm -hmm. we found out that the barrier to enter into the job market was so high. So recently we have uh, expanded our program from education to disability inclusion and in business. We support employment for graduates and uh, also students in universities. And also we are proud to be partnering with the Valuable 500, uh, founded by Caroline Casey, who opened this uh, conference, uh, which is a network of 500 CEOs committed to disability inclusion in their own businesses. And uh, together with them, uh, we are not only um, changed the 500 companies disability inclusive, but we're actually affecting the systemic systematic change of the business sector as a whole. And the last one is um, inclusion in startups. Actually, th this is at still at its ideation phase, but I am wishing that we could have a way to support entrepreneurs with disabilities. So in this conference, I'm delighted to meet and chat with potential partners like startups, investors, and accelerators. And um, I hope that we can together change the system in the ent entrepreneurial startup um, world as well. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. And again, a hand, a hand for the Nippon <laughs> Foundation. Uh, and I think the difference here is that your focus is regional. It's Asia specific, primarily, um, with some national work. And you've got three areas of focus, the PO program, education program, which has a subcomponent on scholarship programming, which is obviously very important for building capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and then your third area of disability inclusion in business, I think, is an important one. And hopefully, we'll have some questions and thinking around that. Um, and then the inclusion in startups, I'm sure, will be of interest to many of the people who are present in the room today. So that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, we'll move along to our next speaker. And our next speaker is Cesar. And Cesar's from the Inter-American Development Bank. So over to you, Cesar. Thank you very much. My name is Cesar Buenaditza. I'm the Chief Discovery Officer of the Inter-American Development Bank uh, Laboratory. I'm a middle-aged man wearing a blue jacket, uh, brown hair, not so much hair lately, but still brown. Um, I wanted to present you first what do we do at the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, we are the biggest, largest multilateral development bank in Latin America. We work with governments, 
with the private sector, and we do have a laboratory of innovation in which we work with innovators, entrepreneurs, and startups in supporting initiatives that bring impact to the region. Every year, we finance around $100 million projects in grants, in loans, in equity investment, in venture capital, and we believe that's part of the initiative that help us to support innovation. I want to present just two ideas, so I'm not running out of time. <laughs> the first one is innovation and intersectionality. This is the story of how our brand was born. If you see IDB Lab, the lab is, has a very nice creative art. That was done by uh, creatives of Casa de Carlota in Medellin, uh, which is a creative studio in which people with disabilities and, and other designers work together to support creativity in Colombia and in the region. They work with us to develop our logo, and we are very proud of that. And that brings me to the first idea, that innovation is connected with what other colleagues here said, with intersectionality. Let me give you two ideas here. The first one is, in terms of the problem, um, we work with Incluyeme in Argentina, Gabriel here, in a program around Venezuelan migrants, some of them have disabilities, and we work with them to provide them with job opportunities in the country. Other idea, we do have a strong program around silver economy. Latin America is the region in the world that is aging faster. So more and more, when we think about people with disability, we are going to connect the ideas also with people, you know, elderly people. So things are going to connect an intersectionality around the problem but also intersectionality in terms of innovation for the solution. We, dis, we do see intersectionality here with creative people working to support innovation. Also, in Mexico, we are working with a specialist Terne in people in the spectrum autism, uh, and, and we are working with them because intersectionality works and technology is very important to, for the solution of the problems. The, the key here is that we work for benefiting poor and vulnerable populations and generating engines for growth. If we only think of entrepreneurs and innovators as people from Silicon Valley, uh, we are no, never going to achieve the inclusion that we all aim for. So we truly need to change, as Josuke was saying before, the idea of what could be an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur, and make it more inclusive, the idea in our minds of what could be the person who is doing a pitch competition and presenting these wonderful ideas. We need to open that because it's a matter of, again, bringing more diversity, not just because it's just diverse, it's because it's good and it's more important for innovation. Um, let me, we do three things. We do financing, so we give, like I said, $100 million every year. We bring knowledge. We've done studies around um, people with disabilities in the job place with Fundacion Onte here. We've done studies around technology and people with disabilities. We believe that data is very important, and something that I'm very kind of obsessed myself is that working around the digital rights of people with disabilities, particularly thinking about innovation, that is extremely important. And connections, how we can connect entities working together so it's not just one by one, but we provide opportunities. <laughs> this is the second thing I wanted to bring, innovation and impact investing. Many people here were saying about grants, and I, we love making grants, but for innovation to scale, we, we believe that we need to support what we call the entrepreneur journey, the journey of the entrepreneur, the journey of the startup. So depending on the phase of the startup from very early stage, you know, maybe we can give like small pilots, maybe with grants, but then we need to provide seed funding in which maybe it's not gonna be a loan or an equity investment because the entrepreneur is not ready yet. So we do have this tool, which is called contingency recovery, in which we invest in the business. If things go right, they give us the money back. If they don't, you know, that is okay. We did that with Especialisterna in Mexico, and that's a wonderful way to provide the right incentives for people to grow and the business to scale. If the business are in a different phase, we could either provide a loan or an equity investment. And then after that, we can connect them with either companies through corporate venturing or to VCs. The whole idea here is that the more you can connect the different stages of innovation with funding, the more you're going to support innovation for inclusion, and the more you're going to support the right incentives for entrepreneurs to grow. Many of the entities here maybe are in the, the phase of, yeah, but how we move from grant 
to impact investing. I think this is a very, very interesting exploration discovery, and I invite all of you to, to do that. And if you want to share anything, I'm more than happy to present our experiences. Uh, maybe let's jump here. Uh, what we can do with the people is that uh, you can collaborate with us and we can work together either in developing co-finance facilities. Again, we are not just thinking of providing grants together. We are thinking more of combining financial uh, strengths. So if you provide grants, we can provide loans, or if you provide uh, maybe some kind of blended capital, we can provide additional uh, connections to the region. So the, the key notion here is that in order to support innovation and for innovation to scale, we need to combine different financial tools and venture money for innovation, for inclusion, and for people with disabilities. I know this may sound a little bit disruptive, but if we truly want to support this kind of innovation, we need to start thinking of the people with disability that are going to be entrepreneurs as people needing uh, any kind of financing that anyone can get in the venture world. So thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to talk with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cesar. And, and I think we all appreciate disruption on this panel. So I think that's actually the way to go. Um, I just wanted to identify what I think were some of the differences in relation to the work um, that the Inter-American Development Bank does. And that is that you work with governments primarily um, and with the private sector. And, and I really thought you know, the, the, your, the value proposition that you set out of financing knowledge and, and connections is a very strong is a very strong value proposition, and I think it's really interesting that while we're talking about intersectionality, that you've brought into it the issue of aging, the aging population. So I just wanted to underscore the importance of that. Uh, so we're going to move along to our next speaker, and our next speaker is from Philia, and her name is Ilara. Mm -hmm. And she's sitting right next to me, so I'm going to hand over to her for five minutes because we have one more speaker at the end of the table. Thank you, and good morning also from my side. So indeed, my name is Ilaria. I work as head of programs at Filea, which stands for Philanthropy Europe Association. Um, I am a middle-aged white woman. I am not wearing green, but have made a, a point to do so next time. Um, and um, I'm here today to give you a bit of a different perspective um, than those of the foundation. So I will tell you a story um, that brings forward a European perspective of the forms of collaboration um, that philanthropy has around disability and innovation. Um, just to, to, to clarify that when I refer to philanthropy, I mean foundations that can be of banking origins, company or family, um, as well as individual funders that invest their financial and non-financial resources for the better goods. And they can do so in many, many different sectors, but we really believe um, that this gives them a distinctive value um, to really be able to um, enter and tackle critical challenges today while remaining independent um, and also having a longer term view. Um, so a couple of words on what we do. Um, Philanthropy Europe Association brings together um, foundations national associations of foundations and members from across Europe or that work in Europe. Um, we really believe that uh, we need to enable, encourage and empower the philanthropic community to build a better today and tomorrow. And we do so in very different ways. Um, we co-create knowledge together, um, developing data on the sector and disseminating it. We also um, learn and, and, and foster mutual learning practices um, that are effective. We bring together uh, members on uh, topics, and so I will dive more into that because it, it is related to disability. And we um, try to build an enabling environment for the better good. So cross-border collaboration um, for the philanthropy sector in Europe is still very complex, and we're trying to bring down those barriers that hinder cross-border collaboration. Um, so collaboration is at the, at the heart of, um, of what we do. And um, we have uh, 13 different thematic collaborations um, that are uh, driving the work of the funders. So I will dive into the one with disability, um, but I still wanted to mention that we are here today um, with some of the members of the Disability Network, as well as children and youth. And we had the privilege yesterday to um, exchange uh, and have lunch with the Zero Project Youth Delegation. So I can only encourage you um, to reach out and listen to their motivations and their ambitions. 
So back to the disability thematic collaboration. They have come together um, uh, quite spontaneously in the mid-90s, um, but they really entered into force around 2008 um, uh, to foster the ratification of the UN conventions for the um, rights of people with disabilities. And um, they have very different ways of collaborating. Um, the philanthropic sector is very diverse. You have heard very different ways of um, uh, grants making, also the geographical, uh, the geographical differences and the, and the stories behind that. Okay, something is wrong with the presentation, um, but I will continue. Um, and so one of the examples that I wanted to bring forward is um, around uh, public-private partnerships and the collaboration that um, 11 foundations had with six cities. They actually um, set up a league for historical and accessible cities by developing trails in urban areas that were accessible. And that methodology um, is now also uh, online. You can find it um, on a virtual library. Um, one, one last message that I wanted to, to um, share with you is that along um, these past years, uh, during all these crises, we have seen the philanthropic sector change. Um, we have a lot of data on that and we can maybe talk about that um, further on. And within this um, crisis is the mother of innovation. And innovation for the in the disability sector is important for improving the life of all of us. We all use um, technology that was developed within and for um, people with disabilities. And we believe that um, philanthropy has a unique role to foster that innovation because of their capacity to take risks, to look long term. And so I would want to finish um, with this, also echo echoing what Bernard Kia said this morning, that together, now, and more. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. So again, I think a different model where we have um, bringing together philanthropy and co-creating knowledge. And I think that's a really interesting um, approach. I think the issue of data has been raised by almost every speaker as an important piece of, of what they do. Um, and then I think it's really interesting because you bring in the concept of um, public-private partnerships as, as a way of, of, of looking at financing. So that's really interesting. It'd be great if we could find some time to talk a bit about the change in the philanthropic sector because I think we're all wondering what that means post-pandemic. Has it changed? Has it changed substantially? What does this mean for disability inclusion going, going forward? So last but not least, I'd like to invite my colleague, um, Anna Maria Fimandis, who uh, is from the World Bank, to make a short presentation. Anna Maria, over to you. Thank you, Charlotte, and thank you, everyone, for uh, attending the session. Uh, my name is Anna Maria Fimandis. I'm a colleague with uh, Charlotte from the World Bank. Um, I'm a uh, white woman with light blonde, light, light brown hair, uh, black glasses, and a black uh, shirt and jacket. So let's uh, start by saying that the World Bank is not necessarily a donor agency, but rather we act as a development partner who works with donors to enable funding this work. The bank is a knowledge bank. We value, we, we add value by creating, curating, and promoting knowledge and global public goods. The first slide that I will show, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. The first slide I'm showing depicts the various funding arrangements we have in place that enable our work on disability inclusion and development. This slide is uh, comprised of four uh, pillars. The first pillar uh, is uh, one of the bank's most powerful tools, which is the International Development Association, which is also known as IDA. It is part of the bank that helps the world's poorest countries through concessional loans and grants. Within IDA are a number of policy commitments that are made, one of which is disability inclusion. This has enabled the bank's work with the, within the poorest countries to involve and include persons with disabilities in our projects, strengthening their voice and participation in the design and delivery of development benefits. Donor funding allows us to deepen our engagement in the disability work. So this goes now to the following pillars, which are entitled standalone trust funds, trust fund grants, and externally financed outputs. Through trust funds and other external funds funded by our donors, 
we can intentionally focus on ongoing existing lending programs in order to have greater impact. Uh, by example, most of the grants given by the two standalone uh, trust funds, which is the second pillar in, our, in the graphic, were mainly linked to large in-country lending programs and operations. Taking, for example, um, Ethiopia or Rwanda, thereby enabling policy reforms leading to deeper impact and results. In the interest of time, I'll move to the second slide, which describes in more de detail around one of the two standalone programs. This is called the Disability Inclusive Education in Africa program, and it was uh, funded by USAID. Um, it was built around three pillars, diagnostics and analytics, pilot activities, and knowledge products. We dispersed over $1.5 million in grants to seven countries in Africa. Um, I will um, name them now, Ethiopia, Ghana, the Gambia, Lesotho, Liberia, Senegal, and Zambia. Um, and all of, not all, but most of these grants were linked to existing in-country education programs. Going to the next slide, which describes our inclusive education initiative. This was a, another trust fund which was built upon the USAID trust fund where we provided in-country grants but also funded analytical work in global public goods and innovation. This trust fund was set up in 2019 with funding of $11 million from the governments of the UK and Norway. The Inclusive Education Initiative, or the IEI, was set up um, with, uh, again, using this three-pillar approach that we used with the USAID Trust Fund. Um, we dispersed close to six million, um, so it's, it was a much larger program supporting three countries, um, and that was to Ethiopia, Nepal, and Rwanda. And all of those three countries, we uh, closely linked the funding to ongoing large education programs in those countries. The second pillar was designed for producing knowledge products and partnerships, uh, including a current very thriving community of practice. Um, and third, uh, the third pillar provided grants for innovations, such as for accessible technology and other catalytic innovations related to inclusive education. In conclusion, uh, we know that there's been a lot of impact on donor funding uh, in the recent um, year. Um, we know that there's what's called poly crises. So between COVID, Ukraine, uh, climate change, food crises, the recent earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, all of these are competing for ever scarcer resources. And we know that very often funding for disability gets dropped as a priority when this happens. Despite our efforts to mainstream disability inclusion in bank projects, we continue to seek partnership with donors because together we can move this agenda forward with greater impact. Thank you. Thanks, Anna Maria, for an excellent presentation. And, and for just highlighting the bank's approach, which is really a twin track approach to have standalone trust funds, but also as Anna Maria pointed out, to ensure that World Bank mainstream projects are including disability. Now I recognize we only have about three minutes, so that doesn't give us very much time, but I do want to ask um, if anybody has a burning question or a comment to please say so, put your hand up or indicate. Please keep your comment or question brief and best say who you'd like it to go to. And we'll have a gentleman sitting in the front. And, and Marcy in the corner over there. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Awesome, thank you all for, for the, the presentation. I could have a question for each one of you. My name is Carlos, I'm from McDonald's Corporation. Um, but I wanna direct this question to Catherine. Um, can you speak a little bit on the, the, the disability approach and how you localize it to all the different countries that you're in? Um, you know, 
how do you meet countries where they are and how do you tailor this approach to that? Great, Catherine, let's hold that question. Um, how do you meet countries where they are? And we'll get Marcy and then come back to the panel. Marcy. Hi, Marcy Roth from the World Institute on Disability. Thank you so much, everybody. Wonderful speakers. Uh, you're all doing really important work. Um, my question is, in light of the um, uh, crises in Ukraine, Turkey, Syria, Ethiopia, many other places that have been uh, disproportionately impacted and people with disabilities and disability-led organizations have been disproportionately left out of humanitarian support. My question for all of you is how do we support these local organizations who are not receiving the humanitarian assistance that they need in order to serve their community? And um, uh, if any of you are interested in hearing about the Global Alliance for Disaster Resource Acceleration, we would welcome the opportunity to tell you more. And uh, um, uh, so looking forward to hearing your responses. Thanks, Marcy. Um, so what I think we'll do, and this is a great way actually to wrap this panel up. Catherine, if you could respond the, to the question that's directed at you. And then I will start from here and just go down and see whether you have any comments in terms of where are we with the funding situation given the poly crisis that Anna Maria mentioned? So, Catherine, over to you. Great, thank you so much for that question. This is Catherine. So, first, we start. question is now hopefully going to drive the work of the group. Thank you. The question is now hopefully going to drive the work of the group. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, Marcy. Uh, so uh, even though we fund in the U.S., we do emergency funding internationally, and we have contributed uh, through uh, the Global Disability Global Alliance to the crisis in Turkey. Uh, at this moment, we do not have uh, humanitarian assistance funding in particular. Yeah, we do very limited humanitarian funding. In Haiti, we are doing result-based uh, humanitarian f funding, which uh, is an interesting approach in a very difficult context as well. I think disaster and emergency is valid for every organization. Maybe earthquake is very specific. It depends on the geographical layout. But look, we have the climate change. So many of us have experienced wildfires. And maybe we'll continue experience other things relating to climate change. So I think disaster and emergency is very critical. And we have to really learn each other and support each other. So your uh, offer to share your experience is welcomed, so we can do it uh, in, in breaks, I think. Hi, um, I just wanted to give a thought on your question and related to what we do domest domestically. So in Japan, we have a lot of earthquakes, flooding, uh, all that. Every, every year, uh, thousands of people are affected and we, uh, in terms of emergency, it's important to have use of the uh, all capacity on the ground, so which includes like, civil society, not only the official, you know, support from the government or the local municipality. Um, so we built um, civil society network in Japan to uh, uh, offer service for everybody in, in need, and I think it's important to make that. Um, initiative more inclusive, we're trying, but I, I think that will um, make a difference on the ground, I think. Um, regarding the question on the humanitarian support, um, the World Bank works mainly through governments. So in the countries that you've mentioned, we work with the governments to um, help them in these cases with the humanitarian 
pieces. But we also partner with the UN agencies, particularly with UNDP and UNICEF. Um, and that's how we would support the humanitarian um, issues. Thank you. So look, thank you to an excellent panel. I think we could have carried on this discussion for many, many more minutes, uh, but we can't. So um, I just think three key words for me sum up this discussion was innovation, technology, and ensuring that persons with disabilities are empowered and engaged. I think that's a really strong message to close on. So thank you all very much for your attention and a big round of applause for the panelists. <laughs>